Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to look at the normal function of the basal nuclei, also called the basal ganglia. Before we get into that on this picture and the next few slides, let's do a brief review of the anatomy of the basal nuclei. So you're hearing me say basal nuclei, but my textbook and my teacher say basal ganglia. They are the same thing. Technically, if you want to be rigorously correct, they are basal nuclei. Why is that? Because by definition, a nucleus or nuclei plural are clusters of cell bodies within the central nervous system. These kind of look like they're in the central nervous system. They're in the brain, right? So they would be nuclei. A ganglion or ganglia are clusters of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. And these are clearly not outside of the central nervous system. They're within it, so they're technically basal nuclei. The reason you will still hear the term basal ganglia is because these were named a long, long time ago. And unfortunately, a lot of people are too lazy to change their ways. But I'll be referring to them as basal nuclei. They're the same thing you're talking about, right? The first structure up here is, of course, the cerebral cortex. This is not a part of the basal nuclei, but when we start talking about the pathway, this is where the motor programs for a particular movement are generated in the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. Now, the first true component of the basal nuclei starts about right here, if we were to draw a vertical line, and then all of this going around looping, this is the caudate nucleus, sometimes just called the caudate. If I take that same vertical line and then go around in this blue circle right here, this would be the putamen. Okay? In purple, this whole thing is the globus pallidus. And it has two parts, an externus and an internus. I think what they're trying to show here in this picture, the kind of lighter purple, is supposed to be on the outside. That would be the globus pallidus externus. And the darker purple part here in the center would be the globus pallidus internus. Then in red here, you can actually trace it all the way around, this red structure is the thalamus. And then we have two other structures here that are very, very closely associated in function with the basal nuclei, so much so that they're usually grouped with the basal nuclei. The first one is in yellow here. It's directly beneath the thalamus, and so it's aptly named the subthalamic nucleus. The most inferior of all the structures is this one down here in orange. This is the substantia nigra. Okay? This is actually the structure that is impaired in Parkinson's disease. And then if we loop around the tail of the caudate all the way down here, this would actually be the amygdaloid body or the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. Now, a few pieces of terminology here. So if we consider the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus, if we specifically group the caudate nucleus and the putamen, combined, these are called the striatum. And you'll see that a lot in the next few videos. The striatum is synonymous with neostriatum. Okay, those are the same thing. Striatum, neostriatum. Now, if we group the putamen and the globus pallidus, those two without the caudate, this is called the lenticular nucleus or the lentiform nucleus. So the lentiform nucleus is the globus pallidus, both parts, externus and internus, and the putamen. Then, if we group all three of these together, caudate nucleus, putamen, and globus pallidus, that is the corpus striatum. So you have to be really careful with this terminology because each one of these, corpus striatum, neostriatum slash striatum, and lentiform nucleus, are composed of different combinations of these structures. So again, just to reiterate that, the neostriatum is caudate nucleus and putamen, also called the striatum. The lentiform nucleus or lenticular nucleus is the putamen and globus pallidus, and the corpus striatum is all three of them. Let's now discuss the basic function of the basal nuclei. And to do that, we're gonna do it piece by piece. We're gonna first look at the direct pathway without dopamine and the substantia nigra shown, and then we'll add in dopamine and the substantia nigra. Then we'll do the same thing for the indirect pathway. Now a little bit about this picture first. Any box here that's gray, which really just includes this one and this one down here, these are going to be inhibitory neurons. They are going to function by releasing GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, and they are inhibitory. The white ones, by definition, 
are excitatory and they're going to function by releasing glutamate or glutamic acid, as we might call it. So the thing about the basal nuclei is if you want to get a movement, the thalamus has to be activated. And it's two specific nuclei in the thalamus, the ventroanterior or VA nucleus and the ventrolateral VL nucleus. These two nuclei of the thalamus have to be activated. Okay? Now this cluster of cells right here is composed of the globus pallidus internus and a region of the substantia nigra called the substantia nigra pars reticulata or PR. I'll usually just talk about the globus pallidus internus, but they're both technically involved. Okay? And these are inhibitory. And if these cells or neurons were activated, they would inhibit the thalamus and inhibit movement. And so in the direct pathway, what happens is certain regions of the striatum, which is composed of the caudate nucleus and the putamen, are actually going to inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Okay? So if they inhibit the globus pallidus internus, then they are inhibiting the function of the globus pallidus internus, which is normally to inhibit the thalamus. And so by inhibiting the globus pallidus internus, they're preventing inhibition of the thalamus, and therefore the thalamus becomes active. And so what you'll find in the basal nuclei, and actually a lot of pathways in the brain, is that to promote activation, you actually need inhibition of inhibition. It's sort of like in math when you had two negatives and you multiplied them together, it became positive. So if you inhibit inhibition, you actually get net excitation or activation. And this process is called dis inhibition because you're removing that inhibition. So when the cerebral cortex commands the striatum to activate, the striatum then releases that inhibition on the thalamus and the thalamus can therefore uh, lead to muscle contraction. So you see here the thalamus actually relays information back to the motor cortex of the cerebral cortex and then it goes down from the brainstem to the spinal cord to specific muscles. So the key is if you want contraction, you have to activate the thalamus and you have to inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Okay? So this is the direct pathway without dopamine or the substantia nigra shown. Let's add those in. So here's a specific region of the substantia nigra called the substantia nigra pars compacta or PC. This is actually the region of the substantia nigra that is impacted in Parkinson's disease. And you can see here that it has an impact on the direct pathway. So the substantia nigra here can actually modulate the direct and indirect pathways by releasing dopamine. So the regions of the striatum that are actually involved in the direct pathway have what are called D1 receptors. These are receptors for dopamine. So the substantia nigra is going to release dopamine and it's going to bind to these D1 receptors. And the key here is for the D1 receptors, the dopamine has an excitatory or activation effect. So how specifically is dopamine modulating the direct pathway? Well, let's compare it to without dopamine. So before we did have inhibition of the globus pallidus internus, but with dopamine, we now have more inhibition. So there's even less activity of the globus pallidus internus. One key here is when this is less active, there is more movement. And then before without the dopamine, uh, the thalamus was still activated, so the globus pallidus internus was mostly inactive, right? But when we add in that dopamine up here at the D1 receptor, notice there's now less inhibition on the thalamus. So the thalamus is even more active, and we get more of that muscle contraction and more movement. So in other words, how is dopamine from the substantia nigra modulating the direct pathway? It's producing more of that movement, more of that movement. Dopamine is pro-movement, okay? Now let's look at the indirect pathway. So this again, dopamine and the substantia nigra are not shown. Let's understand this first. Now by itself, the indirect pathway is going to inhibit movement or it's gonna suppress unwanted movement. So you're sitting in your chair right now watching this video and your arms aren't flailing around, right? You're just sitting statically. So those movements like flailing your arms and legs and so forth, those are not happening because they're being suppressed. So the indirect pathway is always suppressing unwanted movement. The other thing the indirect pathway does is it inhibits certain muscles when you need other muscles to contract. So for example, if you're doing a bicep curl, we obviously talked about you need your elbow flexors to contract because that's how you do a bicep curl, right? Your biceps brachii, brachioradialis, brachialis, those are gonna be activated via the direct pathway. But that bicep curl isn't gonna to work too well if your triceps are also contracted at the same time. 
um, that's going to give you more of an isometric contraction and you're not going to be able to move, right? So the triceps have to relax. And so in addition to suppressing unwanted movement, the indirect pathway also is going to inhibit the antagonist to a movement, allow it to relax so that way the movement is clean and efficient. Now the indirect pathway is indirect because as opposed to the direct pathway, which is in direct connection with the globus pallidus internus, in the indirect pathway, the striatum is not in direct connection with the globus pallidus internus. It goes through this roundabout mechanism to get there, and it has the opposite effect. So again, we have this motor program that's initiated by the cerebral cortex, and it's sent to the other portion of the striatum right here, which has connections to the globus pallidus externus. Okay? And then we have the subthalamic nucleus here, which notice is only a part of the indirect pathway. Now, if we want to suppress unwanted movement, we need to actually have the globus pallidus internus more active. Because remember, when it was less active, um, then the thalamus was more active and we get more contraction. So in order to suppress unwanted movement, we should have more activity of the globus pallidus internus. So more active equals less movement. And normally, the subthalamic nucleus right here is going to be responsible for uh, activating the globus pallidus internus, and that gives us less movement. Okay, and so again, with regards to the subthalamic nucleus, we're again going to have disinhibition. So normally, the globus pallidus externus will be inhibiting the subthalamic nucleus, right? But the striatum, in turn, will inhibit the globus pallidus externus. So if we inhibit the globus pallidus externus, then this is no longer able to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. So we're removing the inhibition on the subthalamic nucleus. This is another case of disinhibition. Two negatives make a positive. The subthalamic nucleus becomes active, and it can then activate or excite the globus pallidus internus. And when this becomes excited or activated, it's more active, and it's able to now inhibit the thalamus. And so if the thalamus here is inhibited, then we have overall less muscle contraction in these pathways and we have less movement. And so overall, the indirect pathway is either going to inhibit the antagonist of a particular movement, so that movement is uh, efficient, or it's gonna suppress unwanted movement. And so you can imagine the indirect pathway is active all the time to suppress unwanted movements. Now let's throw in dopamine and the substantia nigra pars compacta. So regardless of which pathway we're looking at, we're going to see dopamine as pro-movement, okay? It's going to be able to modulate the amount of movement we get by slightly increasing it in both cases. Because if the indirect pathway normally suppresses unwanted movement, maybe in some cases we don't want it totally suppressed. We don't want it to be an all-or-none phenomenon, right? We want to be able to modulate it. So maybe instead of totally eliminating a movement, we just maybe want to slow it down, not totally get rid of it. And so dopamine's a way that we can avoid complete inhibition and get maybe just mostly inhibition, right? So remember with the direct pathway, dopamine here bound to D1 receptors, and that had an excitatory effect on the direct pathway. Now for the indirect pathway, dopamine binds to a D2 receptor, and that actually has an inhibitory effect on the striatum. Okay, So let's actually think about this. Remember that the striatum normally is going to inhibit the globus pallidus externus. But through the D2 receptor, if we are inhibiting the striatum, the striatum is not going to be as effective at inhibiting the globus pallidus externus, and so the globus pallidus externus will have an increase in activity. Not a huge increase, but a little bit of an increase in a dose-dependent manner with the amount of dopamine. So this is a little bit more active. And remember, the globus pallidus externus normally would inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so if the globus pallidus externus is a little bit more active, there's going to be, as you can tell, a little bit more inhibition here on the subthalamic nucleus, and the subthalamic nucleus, therefore, is going to be a little bit less active than it was before. Remember, the subthalamic nucleus normally will activate the globus pallidus internus. And so as compared to without the dopamine, when we start adding in the dopamine, subthalamic nucleus is a little bit less active, and so there's a little bit less activation of the globus pallidus internus. And so with a little bit less activation of the globus pallidus internus, we have a little bit less inhibition on the thalamus, and so we're going to get slightly more movement in the indirect pathway. So what you see here is that instead of totally suppressing a movement, 
we're going to mostly suppress it. So this is a way that dopamine can fine tune everything. And so what we see with the substantia nigra pars compacta and dopamine, got both pathways shown here, dopamine always is pro-movement. It's going to modulate the direct pathway to get a little bit more movement, and it's going to modulate the indirect pathway to also get a little more movement. This is the normal physiology. You have to understand this before you can look mechanistically at Parkinson's disease. But once we get this, we can then look at Parkinson's and understand why we have difficulty initiating movement. So hopefully this video gave you a good idea of the functions of the direct and indirect pathways and also how the substantia nigra and dopamine production impact those pathways. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.